Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be back here. It's good to see you guys. Keep your Bibles open to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. This is a sermon for Religious Liberty Sabbath that Carl explained earlier in our announcements and that you will be collecting next week. Religious liberty happens every year uh, for this offering. And they'd like to have a sermon given concerning religious liberty. The question is, is do you even care about religious liberty? Because I could get up here and I could speak, but if you don't care about it, we're all just kind of wasting each other's time, right? Do you know what would happen if you walk out of this building and your religious liberty comes to an end? You definitely wouldn't be back here next week, right? So is religious liberty important? Yes. Okay. Is protecting it important? Yes. Do you see where we're at in our history and the political climate of this country that uh, religious liberty is something that could be at stake very easily? Yes. Okay. So Galatians 5, verse 1, Paul tells us, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What I want to do this morning is share with you uh, chapter 11 from the book Great Controversy. And this has to do with religious liberty back in the days of Martin Luther in the uh, 1500s, the late 1500s. <coughs> Protestant Reformation was new. <clears throat> it was gaining ground throughout Europe. They had enacted some laws that gave the European countries freedom to preach the scriptures. Can you imagine that? They enacted laws to give them the right to preach the scriptures. We preach the scriptures week after week after week, and we take that for granted. What I want you to understand this morning is that you cannot take this for granted. You could wake up tomorrow, and it could be gone. Unless you are active, you know your history, and you are willing to take a stand for Jesus Christ, that is how you will keep your religious liberty. One of the noblest testimonies ever uttered for the Reformation was the protest offered by the Christian princes of Germany at the Diet of Spires in 1529. The courage, faith, and firmness of those men of God Game for succeeding ages, that's you and I today, liberty of thoughts and liberty of conscience. Their protest gave to the Reformed Church the name Protestants. Its principles are the very essence of Protestantism. A dark and threatening day had come for the Reformation, notwithstanding the Edict of Worms declaring Luther to be an outlaw and forbidding the teaching or belief of his doctrines. Religious toleration had thus far prevailed in the empire. God's providence had held in check the forces that opposed the truth. The deed of Spires in 1526 had given each state full liberties in matters of religion until the meeting of a general council. But no sooner had the dangers passed which secured this concession than the emperor summoned a second deed to convene at Spires in 1529. So from 1526 to 1529, that's how quickly things have changed. That's not even one term of a president of the United States. Now you may ask yourself, why do we need to hear about something that happened in 1529? Because you are told, and it is a law, that if you do not know your history, and if you do not learn from your history, what's going to happen? You're destined to repeat it. Also, you need to realize that you have an adversary, the devil, who has not gone away. And the religious intolerance that you find here in this era of 1529 has not gone away in the year 2020. So, the question you have to ask yourself is why has God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Again, I've asked this question many times, but are we just another denomination? No. Is that what God needed? 
No. no. If you understand history, if you understand anything about the Protestant Reformation, what you realize is that God looked down and he saw the condition of his people and the condition of this world. And there is a reason why they call that time period the Dark Ages. Amen. And the darkness when it came to the light of the truth of God's word, if God didn't step in, the truth would have disappeared. Amen. Amen. And so God took many men. He would raise one up. They would bring in certain truths. They would translate scripture. They'd bring it before the people. That person would pass off the scene. And another one would be raised up. Because darkness had gotten so bad that God could not bring this truth of His Word back at one time. You understand that, right? You heard the, the, the expression, truth is progressive. Can you imagine if God raised up John Wycliffe and gave him all the truths that were lost in the Dark Ages and had him give it at one time? Number one, can you imagine him trying to fathom all of that truth at one time? So do you realize why the Protestant Reformation took centuries? Okay. And what you need to realize is when you come to an understanding of the Protestant Reformation and you come down to the birth of the Advent movement, you realize that God didn't finish with Wesley. And he didn't finish with his brother. He didn't finish with Calvin, but God kept on working and he got to the point where he said that I will take all the truths that have been revealed and I will bring them into one place, one storehouse, to be able to bring them to the people, to prepare them for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Do you know what that storehouse is? Okay. It is God's remnant church. I'll let you figure out what that remnant church is. Hopefully you know that already. Okay. But if you are a student of Scripture and you understand the book of Revelation and you understand the book of Daniel and how they tie together, this is why you're studying Daniel in your Sabbath school class. Do you remember that this time last year, what book were you studying? Revelation. The book of Revelation. That's not coincidence. Okay. If we forget our past, we are destined to repeat it again. Spirit of Prophecy tells us that the only thing we have to fear of the future is what? How God has led us in the past. This is why we're looking at this time period in 1526 and 1529. Okay? So, the deed of Spears was convened in 1529 for the purpose of crushing heresy. The princes were to be induced by peaceable means if possible to side against the Reformation, but if this failed, Charles V was prepared to resort to the sword. Does this sound important? <laughs> These princes during this time of the Reformation understood very clearly what was at stake, and they understood that they were going to have to make a choice and a decision, and they would have to decide whether their kingdom, their wealth, their prestige and their power meant more to them than their walk with Jesus Christ. And as you start to understand what took place at this time, it would have been very easy for them to come to the conclusion that we could avoid war and bloodshed if we just agree with the established church. They gave them the rights, as you'll find out a little later, that in the parts of the kingdom that the Reformation had gained a foothold, they could stay free and they could continue to preach the Word of God, but they could not bring in any new converts. Think about that. This is trickery, because how can you preach the truth and yet not bring in any new converts if somebody new walks into your church and never heard that truth before? They had to come to these conclusions. And do you know how they did it? They were down on their knees and they were asking God to give them insight, wisdom, and direction. 
the whole Reformation. So we sit here in 2020 and we're thinking, was so long ago it has nothing to do with my life. If they made the wrong choice then, you wouldn't be here today. If they made the wrong choice then, you wouldn't be able to have a Bible in every home in the United States. And yet, with that Bible in every home in the United States, how many of those homes actually read that book? Satan never stops working. When the Word of God got to all the people, Satan turned his attention to say, okay, we'll just make this book irrelevant to the culture. And that's where we are today. What happened here ties in directly to what you're doing here today. Amen. Understand that. Because history cycles, and it will repeat itself. And if you don't know the history of the past, you will fall to it when it comes again in the future. So again, a dark and threatening day had come for the Reformation, notwithstanding the either the worms, declaring Luther to be an outlaw, forbidding the teaching or belief of his doctrines. Religious toleration had thus prevailed in the empire. The deed of Spires, as I said, has given religious liberty, but in 1529, they got together again, and they were wanting to crush the Reformation. Happily, and this is a direct quote, Happily, these princes looked at the principle on which this arrangement was based, and they acted in faith. What was that principle? It was the right of Rome to coerce conscience and forbid free inquiry. The acceptance of the proposed arrangement would have been a virtual admission <coughs> that religious liberty ought to be confined to just reform Saxony and that one small part of Europe. And as to all the rest of Christendom, free inquiry and freedom of conscience and the profession of the Reformed faith were crimes and must be visited with either the dungeon, you know what comes next? Yeah. <laughs> or the stake. Could they consent to localize religious liberty? And that's the same question I want to ask you this morning. Will you consent to localize religious liberty? What that means is, as long as you're free, are you okay with that? No. Thank you, Ray. Ray made a comment when Carl was talking to us about the flyer that's in your Bibles, that you said to put in your Bibles, that you were handed today. Ray, what is religious liberty? It's freedom of conscience. It's that you can, you can worship your own thought. Okay? You also said that religious liberty is giving the freedom to somebody to believe who don't believe the same as you do. Amen. This is religious liberty, and this is what you've got to understand, because this is what's going on in Protestantism today, and it's been going on for decades. And that is, there are many churches who would like to take the power of the state to enforce the belief of the church. There was, back in the 80s, a movement to bless legislate religious dogma and morality to the masses. Religious liberty says no. Amen. Because once you do that, you will step on the freedom of conscience of anybody who does not believe that way. So you need to understand that giving you religious liberty is also you have to give the person who doesn't believe in God at all the liberty to not believe in God at all. Amen. Or the people in different churches who believe differently than you, the right <coughs> to worship and follow whatever God that they choose. Amen. But in this country, only one amen to that. Listen, this is the heart of religious liberty. Amen. Yeah. If you don't understand this, if you're just wanting the law to protect you, then you are part of the problem. Amen and not the solution. And if you were back in this day, you would have sided with the church of that day. And you would have been the cause for not having religious liberty in our day today. Amen. Understand this. This is religious liberty. Doesn't sound good that I'm telling you that the person who doesn't believe in your God 
in this country needs to have the right to worship whatever God they choose. And listen, there has been in our country checks and balances that as long as what they're doing does not hurt or constitute a crime, that they should have that right and that liberty. But are you able to say amen to that? Because that is religious liberty. Amen. And if I protect their right, it will also protect my right to worship the true God on His day. Amen. According to His word. Amen. Isn't that what you guys want? Yes. Isn't that why we're here? Yes. Listen. But again, if you're a student of prophecy, you know that there's going to come a time in this country when the Constitution that we hold so dearly will be traveled upon. Amen. And those rights will be taken away. Yeah. The question is, is if we can do something about it in our day, will we stand up and do something about it? We mentioned A.T. Jones back in 1888 into... Uh, the early 1900s, that time period, do you realize there were Sunday laws that were coming to Congress, getting ready to be voted on, and if it wasn't for God raising up this movement, because where did A.T. Jones come from? Did he come from the Baptist church? Did he come from the Methodist church? They were in support of that law. He understood the book of Revelation, and the book of Daniel. And he stood up and he went before Congress and he made a speech and they took a vote and they voted not to enact that law. What would happen if he wasn't faithful? What would have happened if he said, well, that's not my job? He wouldn't exist. Say that loud, Ray. He wouldn't exist today. So you understand, what your forefathers did in the past is why we're here today. Amen. And what you do today is going to matter for Brianna and the little kids that are here tomorrow. Amen. If you don't stand for truth today, what are you going to leave for them as a legacy? Right? Well, they asked him if they, he, they should make the Sabbath today. And he said, absolutely no way. God is the author of religious liberty. He says, this is the way walking in it. But he doesn't make anybody do it. Amen. Amen. God does not force. We're going to get to this in a minute because Martin Luther had to come to this same thing and make a same decision because even after the princes stood up for the right of freedom of conscience, they were willing to use their armies to enforce their dogma. And Luther said, no. Do you know what the Hundred Years' War in Europe was all about? Go back and look at your history. Because again, if you don't know the history of the past, you'll repeat it in the future. Okay, so. And as to all the rest of Christendom, free inquiry and the profession of the Reformed faith were crimes and must be visited with the dungeon and the stake. Could they consent to localize religious liberty? They said, let us rejoice, or let us reject this decree, said the princes. In matters of conscience, the majority has no power. Amen? Amen. We read it again. In matters of conscience, the majority has no power. Amen? amen? Why do I want you to say amen? Because I'm going to ask you a question. This country, is it a democracy or is it a republic? A republic. Why is it a republic and not a democracy? Because if it was a democracy, we'd be mob, mob rule. We'd be hanging people. And this is why our forefathers and the founders of this country made it a republic. Because democracy it can be very dangerous. Because again, as Ray said, the majority will always win. Well, what happens if the majority is wrong? What happens if you find yourself in the minority? This is why there's checks and balances. But when it comes to your faithfulness to God's Word, it doesn't matter whether you stand alone or whether you stand with a thousand. Amen. What you have to make the decision of is, will you stand? Amen. Will you stand on God's Word? That is the question for every generation. 
God's word has not changed from when he gave it to our day today. Is that right? If it hasn't changed, then the principles are the same. Will you stand on that principle or will you fall to culture? Because that's what changes. Right? Amen. Let us reject this decree in matters of conscience. The majority has no power, the deputies declare. It is to the decree of 1526 that gave them freedom that we are indebted for the peace that the empire enjoys. Its abolition will fill Germany with troubles and divisions. To protect liberty of conscience as the duty of state, and this is the limit of its authority in matters of religion, Every secular government that attempts to regulate or enforce religious observation by civil authority is sacrificing the very principle for which the evangelical Christians so nobly struggle. Direct quote from, again, Great Controversy, chapter 11. This nation was founded on that principle of liberty of conscience. Do you understand how that has been perverted in our day to day. Do you remember the phrase, give me liberty or? What kind of liberty was he talking about? Liberty to watch whatever you wanted on your cell phone, on your TV? Liberty to have and produce so much ridiculously bad content that destroys minds and families. Is that the freedom they're talking about? The freedom that they were talking about was the freedom to worship God according to His Word and to be able to live a life and pursue happiness through righteousness. Amen. Amen. And it also means that we should be able to practice our faith without being killed by the government. We can. Amen. And uh, right now, that's under attack. Bro. That's under attack. This was their response in a written document. They wrote that we assert that when Almighty God calls a man to his knowledge, this man nevertheless cannot receive the knowledge of God unless that knowledge comes from God's Word. Do you understand what I just said? Even if God calls a man to a knowledge of him, he cannot fully know and understand that God unless it's by God's Word. Do you understand the importance of Scripture? Amen. Amen. Scripture is how we find out who this God is, what He wants from us, how we worship Him. Not how we think we should worship Him, Amen. but how He dictates to us how we come to Him. Amen. Is God particular or peculiar about how we approach Him and how we worship Him? Yes. Yes. Did that just change, or has that, that always been? Always. If you go back to the book of Genesis, and you go to the two brothers, Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel, there you go, thank you. Was God particular about how they were to approach him? Amen. Yes. One followed God, and one said, no, nah, I don't think God's that particular. I'll bring my best to God. It's what I work for, it's what I produce, it's the best I have. Which one was accepted and which one was rejected? Amen. Only God prescribed. The one who came to God according to how God prescribed was accepted. The one who gave his best work was rejected. Because we can never work our way into a right relationship with God. Amen. This is righteousness by faith. This is what faith is all about. Ready to have your hand up? Yeah, the scripture interprets itself. Where we get into problems is with this extra stuff. <laughs> I agree. And it's that extra stuff that just keeps piling on and piling on. There is no sure doctrine but such as is com conformable. <coughs> conformable. There is no sure doctrine but such as is conformable to the Word of God. The Lord forbids the teaching of any other doctrine. The Holy Scriptures ought to be explained by other and clearer texts. This holy book, in all things, is necessary for the Christian. Easy of understanding and calculated to scatter the darkness. We are resolved, with the grace of God, to maintain the pure and exclusive preaching 
of his only word, such as it is contained in the biblical books of the Old and the New Testaments, Amen. without adding anything thereto that may be contrary to it. This word is the only truth. It is the sure rule of all doctrine and of all life, and can never fail to deceive us. This was what the princes got together, wrote down, and gave back to Charles V. And this is what went to the Pope. You understand what this doctrine says? This is the heart of Protestantism. This is where you as a church come from. This is why religious liberty is so important to us. And if we don't understand why it's important, we have failed as leaders, and we have failed as a congregation. Yeah. This word is the only truth. It is the sure rule of all doctrines and of all life and can never fall or fail or deceive us. He who builds on this foundation shall stand against all the powers of hell. Amen. While all the human vanities that are set up against it shall fall before the face of God. You need to realize, when they wrote this, they understood who this was going to be read to. Oh, absolutely. Okay? If you think and you know from history and from the book Great Controversy that when Luther stood alone at the Diet of Worms, and you had the most powerful people on the face of the earth there staring at him, wanting him to recant, these princes understood they were doing the same thing, and that this is where this was heading, and they had to make a choice. Would they save their own kingdom? Would they save their own wealth? Or would they be willing to sacrifice everything so that you and I could have freedom of conscience? Would you be willing to do that today? You're not asked to give up a kingdom. You just may have to give up your job. <laughs> Even today, that was the greatest assemblage of, of deity, or not deity, but, you know, kings. Yes. And yes. Never been anything like it. Mm -hmm. The princes contained, or the principles contained in this celebrated protest, hence why we are called Protestants, okay? constitutes the very essence of Protestantism. Now this protest opposes two abuses of man in the matters of faith. The first is the intrusion of the civil magistrate, and the second, the arbitrary authority of the church. It covered everything. And the authority of the Word of God above the visible church. In the first place, it rejects the civil power in divine things, and says with the prophets, it says with the prophets and the apostles, we must obey God rather than who? Amen. Rather than man. It lays down the principles that all human teaching should be subordinate to the oracles of God. The protesters had moreover affirmed their right to utter freely their convictions of truth. They would not only believe and obey, but they would have the freedom to teach what the Word of God presents, and they could teach it to anybody that was in their kingdom. And they denied the right of priest or magistrate and obey, but, hold on, but teach what the Word of God presents, and they denied the right of priest or magistrate and obey and teach what the Word of God presents. And they denied the right of priest, oh, that's because it came in here double. I was clicking in, pasting. Okay. It's like, what am I reading here? Okay. What they did is they denied the right of priests or magistrates to interfere. So you understand, the priests and magistrates wanted to, through secular law, restrict their liberty, restrict their right to teach the Word of God. And what they did is actually, through this protest, is restrict the power of the magistrates and the church. So do you think the church was going to, at that time, was going to just sit back and say, oh, this is cool, we'll let this slide. No. No. Power will always protect power. Listen to that and, and, and never forget this. Because the same thing in America. Power will always protect power. And when something comes along to try to take away that power, they will stand against it. 
But he who is in you is greater than he who is in this world. Praise the Lord. You never stand alone. And if you're called to stand for God, and there's one of you and 10,000 of them, who's stronger, you or them? Do you believe it? Do you believe that with God, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me?